This is by far the greatest book in the history of the world. And God has given us this great gift of preserving it down to our day so that we can read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. Let's go into Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and continue our word-by-word study of God's Word. Chapter 47. Before I get into that, though, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Psalms, yes. Yes. Uh, Yeah. uh, When you read of Jacob in the Bible, of course, in Genesis, it's talking about the man, uh, also renamed Israel by God. But uh, after that, when it talks about Jacob, most of the time it's referring to the nation that the nation itself takes on his name. But even more important than that, it's talking about the believers, the Christians. Uh, That's what I yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many times, you know, the believers of all time are referred to by the name of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, because they are our spiritual fathers in, in that regard. Uh, They are held up to us as examples of great faith. They believed God's word, and God counted it to them for righteousness, as we see in Genesis. That's what made them righteous, was their faith in the promises of God, especially that God would come himself and save them, that, that he would come and crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3. Uh... And that by that believing that promise, their sins were forgiven. So when you see Jacob all too often in the Bible, it's not just referring to that man. It's usually referring to the believers, the the holy Christian church, those who have the faith that Jacob had. Good question. And same with Israel. Uh, Don't fall into the trap of the millennialists who say that Israel refers to this modern nation of Israel. It's totally false. Uh, uh, There's nothing Christian about the nation of Israel. Uh, There's nothing Christian about the Jews and the Jewish religion today. Uh, They have rejected Jesus Christ. He is not their Savior. He is not their Messiah. Uh, They have rejected him as much as the Jews rejected Jesus and the day he was here, uh, visibly present on earth to die for our sins. They haven't changed one bit. So uh, the Bible doesn't speak of this modern nation of Israel or, or, uh, or the Jews today as being God's special people in any way whatsoever or in any way related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, as, as Jesus told the leaders of the Jews 2,000 years ago, you are not of Abraham, you are of your father the devil. Uh, and that hasn't changed. Anyone who rejects Jesus Christ as the only true God and Savior of the whole world, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, they're damned. They're not saved. That's made absolutely crystal clear in the Bible. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You reject Jesus. You don't have faith in Jesus. There's no hope for you. Period. Why should we deceive people by holding out some kind of a hope for them? Uh, Just because uh, they call themselves Israel, or they call themselves Jews, or children of Abraham, or whatever they do. That's not, you know, as... Terry pointed out a few weeks ago, quoting Jesus. Jesus said, God can raise up physical children to Abraham out of these rocks. That's nothing. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Great. 
crucifixion, yes, right. Any other questions? Yeah, but to properly read the Bible, Israel is the holy Christian church, the believers in Christ Jesus as their only Lord and Savior. That is Israel. That's the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Abraham is their father, spiritually. Okay, so when you read the Bible, keep that in mind. Uh, Genesis 47. Uh, Let's pick it up at verse 15. Uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of background. I assume that you remember the background that led up to this. Uh, The famine. It's now two years in its seven-year run. A tremendous famine in which there would be no food produced. Uh, No rain, no crops, uh, a complete drought and famine for seven years running, uh, following the seven years of plenty, as God revealed in the dreams to Pharaoh. Okay, so we go to chapter 47, verse 15. This is page 60 in the church Bibles. And we read, And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto who? Joseph. And said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Joseph is shown here as being what? He is the one who's in complete charge. They go to Joseph. They don't go to Pharaoh. They go to Joseph. Uh, Pharaoh has put everything in Joseph's hands. Uh, He is the governor of Egypt. Uh, Now, we're going to see as we go later into this chapter that uh, Joseph serves Pharaoh. And uh, he's making Pharaoh very powerful and very wealthy but not by taxation, not by government force or coercion, uh, not by throwing people in jail if they don't give to Pharaoh. None of that. It's a complete freedom, a complete free market system that we see here at work in Egypt under Joseph. But he is in complete charge of the government. And the government has stored up uh, the food by buying it from the people during the seven years of plenty. You know, all those great years of bumper crops when the people just had far more than they could ever use, and the government went to them and bought it. And the law of supply and demand, the free market, says if there's great supply with low demand, what happens to the price? Huh? Great supply and low demand, price goes down. So he bought it at a low price during the seven years of plenty and filled up these these new storehouses and warehouses all over Egypt, filled it with food. Everything was prosperous. Uh, Low cost of living. Everything was great. And uh, God gave wisdom to Joseph. So that uh, he's a great economist by God's guidance. And he stores all this food up for the government, for Pharaoh. Not by taxation, not by force. He pays the people for it. But he gets it at a good price. Well, now the people have eaten up all the food in their house and in their storehouses and their barns or whatever, you know. Uh, uh, They still have, as we're going to see, they still have some livestock, but they've eaten up all their food outside of the livestock. And uh, for the first two years uh, of the famine, they have eaten their food up, and they've also taken the money 
that they got from the government and any other money they got in buying and selling in their free market. And that's all gone too, because now what do we have? We have high demand and low supply. And then the price what? Goes up. So on the free market, now Joseph goes out and says, okay, uh, I have all this food you know, that we bought in the good years. I'll sell it back to you. But the price has gone up. It's not fair. What's fair is supply and demand. No, well, that's just it. Supply and demand controls the inventories, controls the quantity. If he were to uh, buy it at the wrong price and sell it at the wrong price, there would be no inventory left. He wouldn't have bought as much, and now he would sell too much, and it wouldn't last seven years. Supply and demand is the perfect way of controlling uh, the supply so that it lasts. Uh, you, if the price goes down, and just think of it this way, the price goes to zero, if it's free, what happens to the supply? Yeah, it's wasted. And it, as it approaches zero, as it goes down and approaches zero, that happens more and more. People don't value it as highly, and they waste it. And Joseph knows this. God has given him this wisdom. So he knows to keep enough food for five more years of famine, I can't just give it away. I can't just sell it cheap. I've got to keep the price up. That way people will only buy what they need and they won't waste it. That's the way a free market economy works. So there's no shortages You go to communist countries or socialist countries, there's constant shortages. Look at Venezuela today. You can't even buy toilet paper there. It's a communist government. This is what you get when you start giving away things too cheaply or free. You run out. Free market is a way of allocating scarce resources fairly. That's the fairness of it. Not giving things away freely. That's not fair. What's fair is supply and demand. Keeping it in balance. Stretching out what you have to the most efficient means. So this is... This is the way Joseph uh, operates. He's not only saving the country and Canaan at the same time from this great famine, keeping people from starving to death, he's enriching his boss, Pharaoh. It's a win-win for everybody under dire circumstances. So it's a good thing Joseph is in charge. And Joseph is a Christian. No Christian, no true Christian wants to see anybody starve to death, wants to see anybody suffer. True Christians love everybody, Christians and non-Christians. This is one of the marks of a Christian. This is one of the things that the Holy Ghost, as he dwells in us, moves us to do. But he knows what's best for these people is to not necessarily give them what they ask for at this time. What do they ask for here in verse 15? Huh? Well, no, they don't ask, they don't want Joseph. They They want food free. They want, they say, give it to us. Okay? We're out of money. We're out of food. Give us free food. That's what they want. But Joseph isn't going to give them free food. 
because he loves them. And he knows what's best for them. And what's best for them isn't freebies. Okay? He doesn't want to see them die three years, four years, five years from now. He has to allocate. He has to uh, ration out the food. And the best way to do this is through the free market system. And he knows that. He's wise enough to see that. Fools would say, just give it all away now. But then there'd be none down the road. The shelves would be empty. The storehouses would be empty. Man in his sinfulness wants it free. Man in his sinfulness wants other people to support him. You know, you go out, you produce it, you make it, you work for it, and then give it to me. That's sinful. That's slavery. That's selfishness. That's greed. Nothing good about that. It's not good for anybody. Sin is not good for people. So Joseph doesn't give in to that. But at the same time, he does what's best for the people, and he's going to save them so that they don't die as they say here. They think, give it to us so we don't die. He says, no, I won't do that. Because I love you and don't want you to die, I won't do that. He controls now the food, and it's a good thing he did, because he knows how to allocate it, or the live, to preserve the lives of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. So they say, our money faileth, in Genesis 47, 15. Give us, so we don't die, give us bread, For the money fails. We don't have any more money to buy food now like we have been doing. So give it to us or we'll die. Joseph will not do that. He will not just give it to them freely, even though they don't have money. Because they still have something. They still own something. They are still able to provide for their own living. And that's what's best for people. Provide for your own living. Don't depend on others until you absolutely have exhausted everything you can do for yourself. This is what the Bible teaches in economics. You are responsible for yourself first. And when the Bible talks about giving things freely to people, it's not talking about people who could provide for themselves. It's talking about widows and orphans and people who cannot provide for themselves. The Bible says that a man who does not provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever in God's eyes. Worse than a heathen. You can't get any worse than that. Okay. So he doesn't give in to them here in verse 15. No government welfare. They want it. But he doesn't give it to them. He knows what's best in the long run for them. Verse 16. Joseph said, No, I won't give it to you. What? You give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle, if money fail. You still own livestock. You still have animals in your possession. Why should I give you free things when you still own something? You can still provide for yourself. You can still... Buy and sell. You can still trade. Verse 
Just because you don't have money doesn't mean you don't own anything. They still own two things. What was it? What did they still own? Right, their livestock and their land. But they didn't want to give that up. They just wanted somebody else to give up something for them so they could keep what they already had. So he says, when the money fails, when all the money is gone, the government will sell you food, free market, the going price, by trade of your livestock as payment for the food. And thus the people will make it through another year of no food production. We'll make it through another year of famine, as you can see in verse 18, <coughs> when that year was ended. So they make it through another year this way. Not only do the people make it through another year, but their livestock make it through another year. They don't have to eat their animals now. The government will now have the animals with the food to feed the animals, so both the people and the animals will survive another year of famine. So if the people cannot feed themselves, they could not feed their livestock either, they, so the livestock would die if Joseph didn't do this. What good would holding on to their animals do anyway? So in this way, Joseph saw that the government could keep all of the livestock alive during the famine and still provide food for the people also. And none of this by coercion, none of this by the sword, none of this by police or National Guard or prisons and resting people and taxation and all government force. None of this by government force. It's all free market. Nowhere do you read in any of this history the word tax. I, I defy anybody to find the word tax anywhere in, in any of this, in Egypt, under Joseph. He doesn't see redistribution of wealth as the way to do this. He sees free market buying, selling, supply and demand. It's the best way to run the economy, especially in a famine, especially in a recession, especially in a depression, especially in dire circumstances. It's the best way to do it. So, If Joseph hadn't done what he does here in verse 16, the people would have done what? They would have killed all their animals. Right. He sees that government-free handouts is the wrong way to go. Uh, Communism is not the right way to go. This is definitely not communism that he's talking here. Everyone simply pays the same price of their own free will in the free market. Verse 17. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So they go on another year. Everybody's doing fine. Verse 18, when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year. This would now be the fourth year of the famine starting. Uh, And they said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Still have their bodies. 
And when they say that, what they're saying is, we are able-bodied. We can work. We can produce. We can do something. Even if we didn't have our lands, we have that. We have our labor that we can trade for things. Verse 19, Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. Kevin? It doesn't say they gave it. it. doesn't say the government demanded it. it. says that Joseph bought it. Pharaoh's money. Government? Government just produced it. I don't know. Wherever government gets money. Um... You missed the first part where I was explaining that, that supply and demand was at work here. Uh, During the seven good years, years of great harvest and plenty, the supply was high. People had far more than they needed. And so the demand was low. They could produce their own food and the demand on the market was low. If supply is high and demand is low, what does that do to price? It lowers the price. So God guided Joseph to see this is the time to buy. The price is very low. He could get it at a good price for Pharaoh or the government. Let's put it that way. Pharaoh is the government. And store it up in these big storehouses, warehouses he was building that time. Uh... That's the time to buy. That's the time to store. That's the time to save. Uh, So the people were getting money. It wasn't taxation going to the government. It was money going from the government to the people in the form of free markets. They didn't have to sell their grain to the government. They did it freely to get money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying that in the book of Genesis, I never see the word tax. Well, you got to be careful. You got to be careful with that. You can read anything in the Bible with that word implication. I, I just don't even see it implied. Obviously, he's the government. Pharaoh's the government. Pharaoh's the king. You got to have a government. The Bible says, or there's anarchy. All right. Yeah. And and the government how how the government is established how Pharaoh became king I don't know. Maybe he was already the richest man in the country. I don't know. And then second thing is the people relied on cattle for their food. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. But it but the, but it required food. You have to feed the animals. Yeah. And they didn't have any more food. Um, If there was taxation, it wasn't mentioned. I'm not saying there was or there wasn't. All I'm saying that Joseph never instituted any taxes in all of this uh, allocating of scarce resources. There was no redistribution of wealth. It wasn't taking from one person by force and giving it to another person. I don't read any of that here. 
if that was going to happen, that would have happened already. But now the supply and demand curve has completely changed. Now there's very low supply and very high demand. So the price is going to go up. So he bought low and he's going to sell high. Now, that's serving his boss well. He's enriching Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to get very wealthy. Or let's say this way, the government's going to get very wealthy now through all of this. And all the people will survive. No more than uh, Macy's demands your money when you go and buy a suit there. They don't demand it. They just say, if you want the suit, you've got to give me money. That's not a demand. Yeah, but it's not, it's, not, it's not by government force or coercion. I don't see any coercion here. He's not sending out his Egyptian army into the highways and byways and, and, and forcing all this cattle off the land. They're bringing their cattle to the government and trading it at the, at the fair market price, you might say, for food. Well, I wouldn't say giving. I would say trading. Giving implies... I still don't like the word give. Give, to me, in economics, means freebies. I would rather use the word buy, sell, and trade. Okay, I just want to make that clear. That's why I, 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 I don't use the word give for that reason. Give is the word the people use in verse 15, and I don't think they mean trade. I think they mean give. I think they mean free. I think they mean we don't have any money left, so give it to us. Yeah, yeah. That's the way... God says, because God is guiding this whole process, he is guiding Joseph, that is God's way of, in a sinful, imperfect, greedy world, where people don't like to work, but they do like freebies. They do want somebody else to provide for them. God says, that is not my approved economy. Mm-hmm. But you're still going to pay tax. Now, and, you don't sure, you're going to. Every time you get down to buy something, there's sales tax. That's a lot of tax. If you look at at the amount that uh, federal, state, and local government, all government entities in this country collect in taxes of all kinds, telephone tax, utility tax, gasoline tax, sales tax, property tax, income tax. Everywhere you turn, there's tax, tax, tax. If you add all of that up from all the government entities, compare it to the GDP, Gross domestic product, it's half. The government, at all levels in this country, forces forces from the economy as a whole half of its produce by force. Uh, for example, as an employer, when I pay payroll. To my employees. I cannot give them what they earned. By force, I can't do that. If I gave, if, if, if a, one of my employees earned $1,000 in a pay period, I cannot, by law, give him $1,000. I would be thrown in prison. 
Well, yeah, I don't, you know, employment implies work. But they should work. If they can work, they should work. I'm not saying they should. Okay. Well, they pay it indirectly. They pay it indirectly. Anytime they buy something, the, the tax is built into the price of what they pay for that product or service. It's a tax on the entire society. It raises the price of everything for everybody. Somebody is buying it for them. Nothing's free. Somebody's paying for it. And they're, and they're paying... Well, how long are you going to sit there before you die of starvation? Are, are you arguing with me or what? I don't understand here. Okay, have you made your point? Okay, I think I've made my point. Okay, let's move on. Um. So, under this economy that God is guiding Joseph to, he does not give them what they want in verse 16 when they say, give us freely. Uh, And that uh, works fine for a year. But then, the government has the cattle. So they come to him in verse 17, 18, and 19, and they say, we and our land, we still own, we aren't, destitute, we still have our bodies, we still have our land, we will now trade that for food unto Pharaoh. Notice, not unto Joseph. They go to Joseph in verse 16, or in verse 15 they go to Joseph, but they know that he is simply working for Pharaoh. So they know that when they give these things uh, in exchange for food, they're not giving it to Joseph, they're giving it to Pharaoh, who is the government. So in verse 19, they say, we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. Joseph is not enriching himself at all through this process. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So you got the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year, and the seventh year. You still have four more years of famine, which Joseph knows. But he's not getting rich at, at this. He's not doing it for selfish reasons. The one who's benefiting is Pharaoh. So they come and they freely offer themselves as basically servants to the king. But what's the alternative? Starvation and death. It's better to be a servant alive than dead. God has, through these seven years of famine, reduced the population to their last resort. This isn't Joseph's doing, it's God's doing. And he still says, no freebies. Okay, it's better to live as servants than to die. People are facing death. And that makes people desperate. And uh, they fear death. Now, I just want to comment on that for a moment. Hearken back to Jacob when he came to Egypt and he sees Joseph for the first time in 22 years and he greets him with hugs and kisses and tears and he's so happy to see his favorite son alive who he thought had been killed 22 years before. His mourning is over, and what does he do? He says, now I can what? Now I can die. Is he afraid of dying? No. 
You see the difference here between a Christian and a non-Christian. The difference between faith and unbelief. Faith conquers death. Unbelief, the worst thing that can happen in their eyes, an unbeliever, is death. That is the end. This life is everything to them. This world is everything. And death takes it all away. And that's what they fear the most. Whereas a Christian says, now I can die. Because I I know it's not the end. This isn't everything by any means. There's a far greater life for us in Christ Jesus. He died so that we may live. The message of the Bible is life. The message of everything else is death. You want to find life? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's his gift. Abundant life forever. So we don't fear leaving this sinful world because God promises us throughout the Bible that he is the God of the living not of the dead. And so Jacob didn't fear death. And none of the believers fear death. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I would rather depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And that's the way the believer looks at death. Whereas these unbelieving heathen, Egyptian and Canaanites... The worst thing that can happen to them is death. And they will give up everything else rather than die. We will become slaves rather than die. So they say in verse 19, And give us seed that we may live and not die. Now, Joseph, as I said a moment ago, loves them. And he doesn't want to see them die either. So he is doing what's best for them, even though maybe at this point he's not giving them everything they want. But in effect, he is. He's giving them food, and he's he's rationing it through these economic means. I'm sorry, what was that again? I assume they did. It doesn't say specifically. All it says is, back in verses 11 and 12, Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Now, it doesn't say how he does this. But there's an important difference here. No matter how he does it, they are his family. They are his relatives. And they are the ones that he should be taking care of. If everybody took care of their own family and their own relatives, you wouldn't need the government to do it. So maybe he just gave them things out of his own pocket. But as I quoted the Bible a moment ago, a man who does not care for his own family is worse than an infidel, the Bible says. Now, you've heard the phrase, charity should begin at home. That has a biblical basis. You know, If everybody would take care of their own family and their own relatives, you wouldn't need the government to do it. Because people don't want to take care of their own family and their own relatives, the government has to step in. So, regardless of how he took care of them, whether he made them buy and sell and trade, or just gave it to them, it isn't really relevant. 
Because that's his family. And he has the means and ability to take care of them too. And not only that, but Pharaoh had said he would take care of them also. So he has Pharaoh's permission too. Uh, okay, so verse 20. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Again, notice that the government did not seize the land by law, did not seize the land by fiat. It paid the people a fair price for their land. And who got the proceeds? Who got the land? Pharaoh, not Joseph. Joseph did not himself profit at all from all of his wise dealings. Uh, His employer, his boss, you might say, Pharaoh, is the one who profited from all this vast wealth now pouring into the government. No graft, no corruption, free market, buy and sell. No Joseph getting rich at public expense as a public employee. He could have. He could have been dishonest and he could have cheated through this whole thing and enriched himself greatly. But he's a Christian. And he resists the temptation to lay his hands on somebody else's money and to take it. Even if it's Pharaoh, even if it's rich old Pharaoh, he might have said, oh, he's got too much, he doesn't need all that, I'll take some of it. Pharaoh will never miss it. There's no hint of that at all here. It all went to Pharaoh. No graft, no corruption on Joseph's part. So the people now have traded their land, in verse 20, traded their land, and so they no longer own the land. What's going to happen to them? If you don't own any real estate, what do you do? That's right. That's right. You still have your bodies. You still have your labor. This happens all the time through history. People have no land. Some of the people, a lot of the people have no land. But they work. And they support them and their families through work. And they save. And pretty soon they can do what? Buy their own land again. Without the government stepping in. In fact, if the government steps in, it'd probably be harder for them to do it. The government would be taking all their uh, taxes in the whole buying and selling process. But uh, we see this today, right here in our own country. Does everybody who gets out in the spring and plants corn and soybeans own the land that they're farming? Not at all. What did they do, Daryl? Yeah, they lease it or rent the land from the owner. They work the land and get a cut of it, right? They trade their labor for the part of the produce of the land. Happens all the time. And that's what Joseph's going to do. Pharaoh owns the land, but he's going to what? Under Joseph's control, we're going to see that he is going to now lease out the land back to the people. And the people will give a portion of the produce to the owner and keep a portion for themselves. Yes, yes, when it starts producing again. yeah. In the meantime, they're going to live off the 
uh, stored up food that the government has. But again, by buying it, not by welfare. The Bible says if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. For a person who can work, to not work, and depend on somebody else to work for him, is stealing. And when the government forces this to happen, then the government is taking part in that theft. So, the people now, in verse 20, have they're giving their land to Pharaoh. They would now become tenant farmers to Pharaoh. And it never says anywhere during this entire seven-year famine that anyone died of starvation. They were afraid they were. And I think they would have if Joseph had not been in charge. This godly man, under God's guidance, direction, wisdom, and economy, there would have been mass starvation in seven years of famine. But because God was guiding this, through the free market, you might say, no one died. Not even the livestock. What wisdom? And this wisdom comes from God. So that uh, takes us to the end of the hour. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.